fight. It was just for fun. And the teacher didn't care. And so I had to sit on the sidewalk at recess the next day. And I was upset. I felt like I wasn't hurt. So usually when we feel like, whether it's something at the age of six or the age of 106, if we feel that we're being treated unfairly, we usually want to say something about it. But Jesus did something different than what we would do, and he didn't. This is actually a prophecy we're going to look at today. So if you would, turn to Isaiah chapter 52, uh, verse 13. We're just going to kind of read through this whole prophecy in Isaiah, and then um, kind of go into more detail on just uh, what we're talking about. So we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, and read up through uh, verse 12 of 53. So, behold, my servant shall act wisely. This is about Jesus, by the way. This is a prophecy about Jesus. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so large beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which was has not been told, then they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And who and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, and he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He had put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be counted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So I just wanted to read that whole thing so you can hear the whole context of this verse that we're talking about in Isaiah. So this is the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before Christ ever came. He never physically saw Jesus while he was alive. But this whole thing, and which is really what this kind of series is about, is about prophecies about Jesus. Um, and not all of them are what you would expect. And verse 7 is the one we're focusing on today. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. And so what we're going to see, we're going to go through, Jesus had several trials. Before he was finally crucified, he was arrested, he's been through trial after trial. Uh, through religious leaders, uh, the governor, different rulers, until finally he was crucified. And what we're going to see is that at these different trials, he didn't defend himself, even though he could have, very easily. Yeah. So, the first one to look at, we're going to look at when Jesus was arrested. So, in John chapter 18, verses 1 through 14. John chapter 18, verses 1 through 14, is where we are going to start. So this is, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus, it's the night before he is going to be um, going to be arrested and then put on trial. And he's gone to the Garden to pray. And this is where he prays. And he prays so hard that it says his sweat turned to blood. Um, and so he was you know, clearly in, in distress of what was about to happen. And so here's what the scripture says. Um, we're going to start in verse, uh, we're going to look at, Verse 4. So this is Jesus is in the garden. The people have come, and he knows that they're looking for him, but he asks this question to start with. Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. 
So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into his sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So this kind of sets the scene for what we're going to be talking about. Because you know, we can kind of see two things here. First of all, when they came looking for Jesus, all he said was, well, he asked who they're looking for. He said, they're looking for Jesus. He said, I'm him. And right then the men fell back. Because there's power in Jesus' words. There's power in what Jesus said. Keep that in mind as we're going through and think about what he didn't say and what he could have said. And then at the end, uh, Jesus, so Peter tries to defend Jesus, goes to cut off, probably try to cut the guy's head off. I mean, no one really just tries to cut off somebody's ear. That's not really something people go for. So he tries to go for a guy's head, cuts his ear off. Jesus stops him um, and says, put your sword into his sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So Jesus knew from the very start of this whole process that at, he was doomed at the end to drink a cup that God had given him. And what we know is that that cup that he's referring to is a cup of wrath. It's God's righteous judgment that we should have gotten. And so what we're going to see through this process are these two things to keep in mind. That Jesus is powerful, yet he restrained his words, and also that Jesus had an end goal that he was working for. So, uh, we're going to keep reading in John here, uh, and we're going to start in verse 12. Uh, so, the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So, Annas here, he had been the high priest of Israel. And what happened was the Romans had kind of kicked him out and put their own high priest in place because they were in charge and wanted to do things their way. And so Caiaphas was the one they put in charge. And Caiaphas was Annas' um, son-in-law. So to Israel, they still kind of recognized that Annas, the old high priest, was kind of the real one. But Caiaphas was the one that was officially the high priest. Um, but that's why here they first take him to the person, to Annas, so this is, this is night, first of all. This isn't legal. They arrest him at night, take him to have like an unofficial trial at the unofficial high priest's place. And so they take him there. Uh, and they, this is, I don't know, this is the middle of the night. So there's people there, but obviously it's not all the people you would want for a trial. And they go ahead and they start asking Jesus questions um, and kind of determining his judgment ahead of the official trial. Uh, so Annas, again, was kind of the real high priest, and Caiaphas was the uh, the official one that Rome had put in place. And Caiaphas earlier had advised the Jews, he had told the Jews uh, that it'd be good if Jesus died instead of the whole Jewish nation. So he was of the opinion that Jesus was bad for the Jews, and so they should kill him and save the entire nation. And so that's what's going on here. Caiaphas advised everybody, hey, you need to get rid of Jesus. And so they arrested him and bring him to Annas to start the whole process of his trial and execution. So if we go down to verse 19 of John chapter 18, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me uh, what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, Bear witness about the wrong, but if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So what I want to clarify real quick here is that when, when we're talking about Jesus being silent, what I don't mean is that he literally did not say a single word throughout the whole process, because the scriptures lay out clearly that that's not what happened. But what we're going to see is that as they bring specific accusations about Jesus, he's not going to respond to them. He's not going to um, defend himself against those. And here, he doesn't really say uh, that, he doesn't really say anything against what they're accusing him of. All he says is, I've been out in the open and ask other people what I've said, and they'll tell you. Um, and so, this is the first part of the process, his first line of questioning. They slap him in the mouth, say, hey, don't talk to the high priest that way. And then they keep on going to the next step. They send him to Caiaphas, who is the official high priest. Uh, and then we can see more about what goes on with Caiaphas in 
in Mark chapter 14. Go there next. Mark chapter 14, verses 53 through 65. Mark 14, we're going to start in verse 53. Here we go. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, uh, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimonies against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. So first of all, they take him to Caiaphas, and they're trying to get witnesses to come forward. So remember, Jesus told them, Bring, let people talk about what I've said. I've said it in the open. Let them say something. And so now they're here, and people are coming up and saying stuff, but they're lying, and their testimony, like the things they're saying, don't match up. And so they're bringing all these false accusations, and it's pretty clear that it's not true because it's, they're not lining up. So then they keep going. Uh, and some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And so this is something Jesus actually did say. So he said he would tear down the temple and build it back up in three days. Now, he was talking about himself, that he was going to rise from the dead. Um, but here, this is, this is the most accurate accusation they've made so far. It's based on truth, and they still don't have it quite right. And so the high priest stood up, this is verse 60, stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Had you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And so began to spit on him and cover his face to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. So they have all these false testimonies. This trial's not really working out. And finally the high priest just says, Are you the son of God? Are you the son of the blessed one? Are you the Christ? And Jesus, Jesus all he said was, I am. And then he says that you will see, what does he say here? Oh, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So essentially what he's saying here is, it's true. I'm the Messiah. I'm God. He didn't, he didn't speak out against the false accusations. He didn't speak out when they were falsely accusing him and lying. All he did was admit here to who he was. And right then they condemned him. That was the only answer he gave. And that was enough. That's all they needed. Just to hear him say who they didn't want him to be. So that's the trial with the high priest. This is the official trial with the high priest and the and the council and the scribes and all the religious leaders uh, that were in Israel at that time. And so then they sent him on to Pilate, who is the governor, the Roman governor of the district. And so in Matthew chapter 27, um, verses 11 through 14, we're going to see what happened with Pilate. So Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 through 14. It says this. Now Jesus stood before the governor. Uh, which again, that's Pilate. And the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge that the governor was greatly amazed. So here again, Jesus didn't respond to the false accusations or the things the Jews were saying. All he did was when he was asked who he was, he said who he was. He just agreed, Yes. I'm the king of the Jews. That's that's what you're saying. That's that's true. So he's gone through Annas with the, the kind of the false trial with the guy who wasn't technically the high priest. Uh, he's gone to Caiaphas and the official council. He's been to Pilate now. But then Pilate finds out that he's actually uh, kind of under Herod's King Herod's jurisdiction. So Pilate doesn't want to make a decision. He sends him to King Herod. So Luke chapter 23. Uh, we're gonna start in verse six. I think another lesson we can take from this is that uh, this is just an inefficient system they had working out here for how to make how to get trials done. So uh, we're at we're up, to, we're up to what four trials now, something like that. So he's uh, he's at, at King Herod. This is uh, Luke chapter twenty-three, verse six. Pilate sends Jesus to King Herod, and uh, 
Yeah, so when Pilate heard this, he asked one of the men of Galilean, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. So he sends him to King Herod, and Herod's excited. He wants to see Jesus because he hasn't yet, and he's heard that he does cool tricks. He's heard that he does miracles. He does he walks, walks on water. He makes the dead live again. And so he wants to see Jesus do some magic tricks for him. And so he questions Jesus. He, he tries to get him to do something, to say something, and Jesus, he isn't. He's silent. He doesn't respond to the accusation. So the Jews are still accusing him vehemently, uh, it says. And then Herod even dresses him up in fine clothing, mocks him, and then sends him back to Pilate. He doesn't get what he wants. He doesn't get the cool tricks. Sends him back to Pilate. But apparently, Pilate and Herod became friends this day because they were both making fun of Jesus. And I guess that was enough to make them friends. So, not a great... Not a great trial, but Jesus is still silent, and he goes back to Pilate, and this is going to be the final trial before Jesus is finally crucified. Uh, we're going to keep reading in verse 13 here in Luke chapter 23. Pilate then called together the chief priests and rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is misleading the people. Um, and said to them, anyway, I lost my spot here. You brought me this man as one who is misleading the people, and after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. So all these trials go by, and Pilate, uh, I guess, has the, the, the common sense to see clearly this guy's done nothing wrong. His testimonies don't line up. I can't find anything wrong. Herod can't find anything wrong. I'll just punish him, whip him or something, and then I'll, I'll release him. But that's not enough. The Jews aren't happy with that. Let's look at John chapter 19, verses 1 through 12, and we're going to see one final conversation between Herod, between Pilate, and Jesus. John chapter 19, verses 1 through 12. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. So remember, the, one of the accusations was that Jesus said he was the king of the Jews. And so and Jesus said, yes, I am he. And so part of the mocking here is, oh, if you're the king of the Jews, let's make you a crown. We'll make one out of thorns, and they put it on his head. And they, so this whole crown of thorns, the robes, all that stuff, uh, that was part of mocking. It wasn't a common punishment to put a crown of thorns on somebody. It was them making fun of who he claimed to be. So they arrayed him in a purple robe with a crown of thorns on his head. They came up to him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. So Pilate, again, he doesn't see any guilt. He still lets his men kind of mock him, beat him up a little bit. And the Jews want him crucified. A, a torturous, awful death. So it's one of the worst forms of execution, maybe the worst that people have come up with throughout history. And then and then he says, you know, I can't, I don't see a reason to put him to death. And the Jews say, according to our law, he said he said he was God. And so, or the son of God. And so he should die. And then Pilate's afraid. He's, I mean, I'm guessing he's heard the things Jesus can do. He's probably, I mean, he's governor of the district, so he's probably heard rumors at the very least about what Jesus can do. And so if you're, I mean, you've got to think twice if you're about to kill somebody who says he's God who can work miracles, right? That's got to make you think twice about the decisions that you're making. So he becomes afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So he wants more information. Asked Jesus, he was trying to find out who Jesus actually is. Is he the Son of God? And so he asked, Where are you from? And Jesus doesn't answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You have no authority over me at all, unless it be given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you 
as the Creator said. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So, Pilate goes back in, he questions Jesus again, he's afraid, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to try to crucify God here. And so he asks Jesus who he is, and, and Jesus is not answering. And he finally says, don't you know that I, I'm the one who's making the decision here about whether you live or not? And Jesus just says, you, you don't have that authority. The authority. Any authority you have was given to you. And so Pilate, after that, he tried to find a way to free people. He tried to find a way to not crucify Jesus. If somebody says that to you, and they have power behind what they've done, I'd be a little afraid, too, of killing him, of trying to kill him. But in the end, he, he gives in. And the reason is because the Jews say he calls himself a king, and if you let that man live, you're not a friend of Caesar. Because Caesar's king. And so if you let him live when he thinks he's a king, you're really being, you're not loyal to Caesar. And so in the end, for that reason, Pilate starts the whole process of crucifying him. But if you look in, in all these accounts, there's, there's this common thread for Jesus at these different trials is not responding to his accusers and defending himself against the accusations. And so I think that um, again, this is a remarkable thing just from a, a, a purely practical story standpoint because normally if you are innocent and you are accused of something, you're going to say something about, hey, that's not true. And Jesus didn't do that. And again, at any point, think about in the garden when he was arrested. He just said, I am he, and the men fell down and fell back. There's power in what Jesus said. So why did he do this? And the reason, well, one reason is that, first of all, he he wanted, he wanted had to fulfill the, the prophecy about it. He was fulfilling the prophecy so people would know that he was the Messiah, he was the Lord, he was the one who they prophesied. But then also, um, he, he knew that he had to go through the crucifixion in order to uh, die for our sins. He knew there was an end game. Remember, at the very start of his arrest, he said, am I not going to drink the cup? He knew that he had to be the one to suffer the wrath of God on the cross in order to, for our sins to be forgiven. So throughout this whole process, he's remaining silent because he knows if he speaks out, he might be found innocent. And that's one of the worst things that could happen for us. If Jesus, if justice is done here in this whole court system, this really inefficient court system that goes through five or six trials, if he's found innocent like he should be, we don't get forgiven. And Jesus has that in his mind the whole time. So out of love for us, and out of love for the people he's dying for, and out of knowing the necessity of our salvation, he keeps his mouth shut and doesn't defend himself so that he can go to the cross. The Bible says that no greater love has man than this, that he lays out his life for his friends. So this is the, the ultimate task of love, that throughout this whole process, because first of all, just going through that process sounds like a nightmare. But second of all, to not defend yourself through it, that's, that just shows his love for us. And I want to I just take a, a second to think about how unfair this whole was. Not, not just how bad it was or how, um, or like how, how beat up he was. Those, those are all things he's talked about. Just think about how unfair this was. He was arrested at night uh, and then brought to somebody who shouldn't have been holding the trial. And then was brought to the religious leaders. And they would pass around to different government leaders, and none of them could find anything wrong, and he was still crucified. And not only that, actually, after part of Pilate's process of determining that he would crucify Jesus, and I didn't read this particular part, but it was he gave them the option. He said, I have this guy who's actually a criminal, and I have Jesus, who's innocent. Who do you want to kill? He put it up to a popular vote. Can you imagine if that happened today? If the if the governor of Virginia, if Youngkin, came out and said, All right, I've got this guy who's done nothing wrong. And I've gotten this guy who's been in the prison system for a couple of years, and he's killed 10 people. Which one do you think deserves the death penalty? And then everybody voted for the innocent guy? That, that's, not, that's not the way it should work. So I know, for me, I'm a middle child. I know my mom likes to say that middle, middle children are more, think about fairness more. And so for me, that, that was just, that's just not fair. That's just not right. That's not justice. <laughs> and so throughout this whole process, though, Jesus, again, he didn't argue against the system. He didn't put up a fight, he, he simply surrendered to God's plan for salvation for us. And at any point, he could have stopped it. I mean, he spoke the world into existence. He spoke and the blind would see. He would speak and the lame would walk. He would speak and, and uh, it did, I mean, think of all his miracles. The, the dead would live, the, the deaf would hear. 
all these things, he would just speak and things would happen. So at any point he could have spoken and it would have been done because of that much power in his voice. And so it's almost this beautiful irony that with all the power Jesus has with his words, he had just as much power in his silence because that's what led to our forgiveness. There was just as much power in his silence as in his words. And so what I want us to, our response to this, first of all, if you if you haven't accepted Christ, if you haven't given your life to him and put your faith in him as your Lord and Savior, do that. See his love for you. See, see what he's willing, what lengths he's willing, or willing to go to in order to forgive you, in order to provide a way that you can come to God, you can be forgiven. So if you've not done that, do that today. And then second of all, if, if you do know Christ, Take this opportunity to, to thank him for what he's done and for who he is. There's been no greater love than that love he showed throughout the whole process. There's been no, no more grace that could have been given than what, than what he gave even from before he was on the cross through his silence. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and we'll close. Um, and let's just think about that and, um, and thank God for his, his goodness and his grace toward us throughout that whole process. So, Father, I, I thank you today, and um, I, I just thank you for your your, your silence. It's, it's an odd thing to thank you for, because usually if we, we think of your silence as, a, silence as a bad thing, that if you don't give us direction or don't say something, it's bad. But here, Lord, we can see that your, your silence is a good thing. And so we thank you for your willingness to be, um, to be shown guilty, even though you were innocent. We thank you for your willingness to... God, to, to go through what was unfair, what was unjust, but yet to be silent. God, and I thank you for doing that on our behalf. Thank you for um, having the, uh, the courage and the love and the grace to step into that role and to uh, do that on our behalf. Thank you. We love you and we thank you. We just ask that you continue to give us more and more knowledge, more revelation about this, about this path you took, about the, the cup you drank, the sacrifice you provided for us. We love you, Lord. Would you stand right now and take out the last song of your song sheet, the last page?
You cannot get rid of our sin. We cannot change the course of sort of our history and our eternity. But Lord, you can. And Lord, there is all power in your voice. Lord, you spoke the word and the world was made. You spoke the word and lives were changed. And Lord, we know at the end you'll speak the word and the final battle will be won. But Lord, over our life, you speak words. But Lord, in this moment, you remain silent so that we could have hope. Lord, maybe there's someone here today that doesn't know that hope, someone who's watching that doesn't know you as their Savior. Lord, we just pray that in this moment, in this time, that Lord, they will receive you, they will accept you. Lord, because you love us so much. Church, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, do you know Jesus? Do you know him as your Lord? We're going to say a simple prayer that comes straight from the scripture. I want you to pray it with me. If it's your first time, he says he'll take your sin away and make you a child of God. Maybe you've prayed it in the past. I'm just asking you to pray it once again with those that may be praying it for the first time. We're going to believe together that according to the word, they shall be saved. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead. Based on that confession, I am saved. My sins are gone. I'm a child of God. Thank you for changing my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you will, just slip up your hands. I want to pray a prayer of blessing on you. Lord, we thank you that you love us. And Lord, right now, I just pray your blessing on your people. That, Lord, that they will be blessed indeed in their rising in the morning, in their, Lord, laying down at night. And they're coming in and they're going out. Lord, at work, at home, in the marketplace, wherever they may be, let them see and sense your blessing. Lord, let it come upon them and overtake them and surround them. And Lord, follow them as a rear guard. Lord, we thank you, the Lord, that your face is upon us. And Lord, your, your countenance looks upon us. And Lord, you give us your peace. Lord, I just pray that, Lord, today, even at lunch, they're blessed. The Lord, through this week, they are blessed. The Lord, they'll sense your presence as never before. And Lord, even though, Lord, sometimes it seems you may be distant, sometimes we don't sense your closeness, but you're there. Let us know we are blessed and you are good. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. Thank you for all that you're going we give you the praise. We give you the honor. In Jesus' name. The church says what with me? Amen. Amen. Let's sing this chorus one more time.